want to talk for just a few moments about which boat you're on, about which fellowship you are a part of. My great-grandfather, who was an incredible man of God and pastor of decades upon decades, used to say a lot of things to me when I was a little kid that I didn't really understand until later on. And I remember him looking at a young me and saying, fellowship is nothing more than two fellas in one ship. And I would just kind of nod and say, okay, Papa, and get the candy and leave. But the more that I have thought about these little one-liners and nuggets of wisdom that he's given me, and that's the only one I'll probably share with you tonight, the more I began to realize that fellowship really is two fellas in the same ship. We gather here, and as Baptists like to do, they like to redefine terms. And so uh, somewhere along the line, church became a building rather than the people. And so we're working hard to take the name church back and give it the meaning that God intended it to have. Uh, Somewhere along the line that we thought, you know, well, the church house, God's house, that was several thousand years ago. And then Jesus tore the veil and now you are God's house. Um, This is a wonderful facility, but there's nothing holy about this place. There's a beautiful song, we're standing on holy ground, but we're not. Um, We're standing on a carpet, and it's great, and I'm glad to have it. Um, But fellowship, we've taken the word fellowship and we've defined it as uh, food. We're going to have a fellowship, and everybody gets real excited. Because when we say we're going to have a fellowship, it means a few things. Uh, We're going to have some fried chicken. We are going to have a casserole of some kind. There's going to be a crock pot with something in it. And then the Lord knows that um, our sister back here is going to bring desserts that are going to make everyone want to slap their moms. And it's just going to be an incredible time. And so when we hear fellowship, we get real excited because we think we're going to fellowship. But Like the word church has been misunderstood, we are churching together with the church, not in the church. Um, Fellowship is something we can do around food, and I'm so grateful that we can. But fellowship is when we're in the same boat. It's when we're headed the same direction. It's when we encounter the same storms and experience the same victories. And the direction of our fellowship may not always be a good one. But as we examine our hearts and our lives tonight, and as we dive into a few different passages of Scripture, I wonder if we won't allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight and have Him cause us to realize, yeah, I'm in that same boat. That situation you're talking about, that particular attitude, that particular direction, I'm in that same boat that in mind, we're going to dive into the book of Revelation tonight, the book of Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, when you're ready to jump into God's word, say jump. Starting in verse number 11, the Bible says, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want to go back just to examine a phrase quickly in verse number 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. We could spend hours upon hours, probably weeks upon weeks, diving into all of the complexities, both the wonderful and the awful things that are taking place in this particular passage. But 
Tonight, as we examine which fellowship we are a part of, and while we would all love to claim that we're a part of the fellowship of revival and that we're primarily of the fellowship of Central Baptist, we're going to see through a particular illustration that we could be in the same building, but rowing in different directions. We could be under the same roof, even sitting on the same row of pews, and yet be a part of a fellowship that has a different destination in mind. And in this particular passage, John is writing about witnessing a time of judgment. And everyone must stand before the judge. Take it to the bank. There is one thing that you can count on. We're all going to die. And when that happens, every single one of us, every person we know, no matter how healthy you eat, no matter what oils you rub on your body, no matter what medications you take, no matter, and, and some of us are saying, I'm not doing any of those things, I'm going to die happy and make a pretty corpse. Um, you're going to die at some point, and at some point, every soul that has ever existed will stand before the judge. And in verse number 13, there is a particular location which holds the bones and bodies of many who have died by way of many different types of storms. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. I remember as a young person going to camp, I remember being maybe 9 or 10 years old, and the preacher at this particular week of camp really began to develop the illustration that I want to bring to you tonight and I remember listening to it and being captivated by all that was taking place and that was before podcasts and YouTube so I wish I could go back and just glean everything that he showed but in my study I started to dive deep into who's in the sea who's in the sea and on March 31st of 1909 construction began on the world's largest passenger ship from rudder to stern the ship measured 883 feet making it one of the largest man-made moving objects on earth at the time if not the largest man-made moving object if removed from the water and stood on end it would have been one of the tallest buildings in the world at this point in history but what made this boat so tragically infamous was the event that occurred on late April the 14th in the year 1912. The world's largest man-made moving object struck an iceberg at 11.35 p.m. And in approximately two hours and 45 minutes, the floating palace, the boat that had been dubbed the unsinkable ship, found its way to the bottom of the ocean in two separate pieces. And on that historic and fateful night, over 1,500 people lost their lives. But within a 60-mile radius of that particular ship and that particular earth-shattering event were four boats, in fact. The primary and the most famous of all of them being what you and I know and what you see pictured behind me, the Titanic. But within a 60-mile radius of this particular unsinkable ship were three others by the name of the Samson, the Californian, and the Carpathia. And as we examine the MO of these particular ships, we start to see some principles that Scripture speaks to. And as we look at the direction of each and every one of them, we're going to start to see because Scripture was written to people, we see that people suffer from the same problems repeatedly. History continues to repeat itself. As you and I examine our lives, every person in this room will find themselves on one of these four ships. I want to spend just a few minutes looking, first of all, at the Titanic. It took over three million rivets to assemble it and over two years to oversee its completion. There were 840 staterooms on board, the boat weighing 900 tons. There were over 10,000 light bulbs illuminating the gorgeous architecture of which you have seen many photos. The ship was home to a gymnasium and nine separate decks. The second mate of the ship, when interviewed, commented how it took him over two weeks to learn the layout of the ship uh, in order to make it from one point to the other. One could walk 
miles aboard the ship, finding themselves lost, if not careful. Each one of the three propellers on board the Titanic were nearly 23 feet in size in order to move this behemoth work of art across the ocean and over 2,200 passengers on board the boat, some spending as much as $1,000 per day to enjoy the first-class amenities. Two such individuals were these two that you see right here. The first one's name is John Astor. Uh, He was a very rich and a very famous and a very powerful man. And he was, in fact, one of the richest men of his day. He would have been considered much akin to Bill Gates. When his body was discovered, he had over $2,000 in cash on his person, not to mention what was in the safe of his room, which did not even hold a candle to what were, were in the bank accounts that he represented on The other side, you see a wonderful couple, Isidore and Ida Strauss. They were the co-owners and founders of the Macy's department store. Over 2,200 men and women, be they of great renown or ordinary significance, set sail, never expecting what they would encounter. Only 706 would live to tell the story. Now, unlike what you might have seen on a really popular movie, no one was locked away from a lifeboat that night. Uh, That was a Hollywood embellishment, much as uh, most of what they produce is. But the Titanic was fittingly called the Floating Palace. She could travel at 24 knots, making her the fastest ship on the water. And when she hit the side of the iceberg, she was traveling at 22 knots, almost full speed. The engineers had claimed that she was the unsinkable ship, and one of them was notably quoted as saying, even God himself could not sink this ship. They said this because the Titanic had 16 watertight compartments, and any four of them could be ruptured and flooded at any one time, and the boat continued to move at full speed without missing a beat, but contrary to what you might read in a museum, contrary to what you might see on a screen, the truth of the matter is God sunk that ship. I believe that all signs point to God sinking that ship, and I want to prove that to you tonight because it took over two years to build her and a little over two hours to destroy her. And 100 years later, the decay has almost rendered her unrecognizable. Nothing that man could ever build will outlast the sovereign hand of an almighty God. Nothing that you and I could ever raise into ourselves in our own name will ever, ever outlast the hand of almighty God. One day, everything will burn. One day, every knee will bow. Why would you suggest that God sunk that ship? That sounds a little uh, mean. It sounds a little insensitive. I'd like to give you four reasons. In fact, I'd like to give you four undeniable facts researched and uh, recounted to you today. First of all, I believe if we take a look at the timing. If we take a look at the timing, scientists estimate that in order for the iceberg to have been at that exact place in the ocean, at that exact time, It would have had to have broken off from its place of origin to get this two years prior to that moment. You know what that tells me, friend? That tells me that right around the same time that construction began on a ship, that it would be notably said, even God himself can't sink it. God knowing the pride that would fill the heart of men allowed for an iceberg to detach from its glacial home and float its way slowly to the exact place where the unsinkable ship would meet its fate that particular night. Now those who know me know that I have an affinity for travel buses. I, I, I grew up on the road. I love touring. There's nothing like sleeping in a tour bus. You get to pull the curtain back. It's like being in a little coffin. There's an air conditioning vent and it just kind of rocks you to sleep. If they made a bed that had the sound of a diesel engine and just kind of moved like this all night long, I would buy it. My wife would never sleep, but I would buy it. 
And so growing up, I always felt like that was just one of the safest places on earth because you're looking at a machine that is built of solid steel and there is nothing that you can do really to destroy it. It would have to be a freak of nature. It would have to be something uh, that would have been an act of God, as an insurance company would call it. If a car meets a tour bus on the road, one of them will last and the other will not. And it won't be hard to tell which one. But not too many years ago, I remember that the Christian school that I was from was returning. I was not on this bus or in the school at the time, but they were returning on what was my favorite vehicle to ride in in school. It was the massive tour bus that had the TVs in the bathroom and the the seats that were comfortable. We're not talking about the yellow bus. We're, We're not talking about the short bus. We're talking about the tour bus, the tank was driving down Interstate 465 in Indianapolis, Indiana. This machine, which was built heavy and built to last, with engines that were intended to last into the millions of miles, was being driven by a man who we were all familiar with. He was affectionately known as Grandpa to so many of us at our particular school. But on Saturday, July 13th in 2013, The pastors and the leaders and the students of my alma mater stepped foot on their 45-foot Prevo travel bus. And they were less than just a few miles from returning from an incredible week at church camp when over 60 people on board this bus experienced something that they will never forget. Traveling at a normal speed around a normal curve on a normal day, the man who was driving the bus began to shout, no brakes, no brakes. And he did everything he could to turn that curve on the interstate that day, but without the ability to slow the bus, the bus turned over a concrete median. And there, a teacher lost their life. Both youth leaders lost their lives. And in the final act of what only a mother could think quickly enough to do. She snatched her baby seated by the window from his car seat and lifted him up so that as the bus turned aside, she lost her life, but her precious eight-month-old did not. Youth pastor Chad and, and Courtney, along with this teacher, lost their lives before the eyes of students and children, and no one anticipated that fateful turn. But I'm here today to remind you that Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. And you do not know when your time is going to come. And there are some of us maybe seated in this room or maybe you're watching online and you're hearing this. Let me be the voice of the Holy Spirit tonight to remind you directly from God's word that it is appointed. There is an appointment coming. There is a time coming when you are going to lose your life and after this, the judgment the judgment. You will be judged. Do you know Jesus? There is a time when you will lose this life. Will you find eternal life on the other side of that particular appointment? The choice is yours. The free gift of salvation has been given to you. Have you accepted it or or are, are you on a journey toward eternal death? There's a piece of land around here somewhere that has never yet been overturned by a shovel with a piece of stone that has not yet been carved in. And it doesn't matter how amazingly you live. Some of the most exercised, crazy people pass away when God says it's time. You are not invincible. And it didn't take an atomic bomb to sink the unsinkable ship. All it took was a hunk of frozen water. On this particular boat, there was china that had not yet been eaten off of. There were 1,000 loaves of bread, 850 bottles of liquor, 6,000 pounds of butter, 10,000 pounds of cereal, 25,000 pounds of chicken. One passenger's diary records the smell of fresh paint still wafting through the air as they boarded the ship that had been carved Staircases carved by hand, chandeliers that had been assembled by hand. They were prepared for the party, but they were not prepared for the time that they would part 
this earth and step into eternity. And today, you might be on the Titanic, headed toward death, and you don't even know it. Are you ready? Luke chapter 12 says this in verse number 19. I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat and drink and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Some of us are spending all of our time and all of our effort, all of our energy and all of our money in an attempt to raise up monuments to ourselves. We may not be building buildings, but we're really focused on that trophy and that trophy case has to say my name on it. That plaque on that particular piece of furniture has to say my name on it. That building will one day say my name on it. This is going to have my name on it. This is going to be my my legacy, and this is what I'm going to pass down to the next generation. But the most important thing that you could pass down to the next generation won't be a dollar sign in a bank account or a piece of property. It will be a faith that can carry them for eternity. Are you ready? Are you ready? It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so many are floating through life, tossed about by every which particular wind and storm, thinking everything's going to be okay. I'll wait until I'm on my deathbed to accept Christ. I'll wait until I'm older to get serious about serving Christ. I'll wait until that invitation song to pray that prayer. I'll wait until I'm personally invited to make that decision. I'll wait until the need is so great to step in and be a part of what God has commanded all believers to do, to serve his bride and to reach the community. It is appointed unto man once to die. And as we spoke about just the other night, there are two choices on the self, going, going to heaven or going to Some of us are prepared for any party. We're not prepared for the party. Some of us are doing everything we can to store up in a retirement. And friend, the rapture could happen tomorrow. Hear this. I'm not telling you to be financially unwise. God speaks specifically about being a good steward. I'm not telling you not to enjoy the things of life. God is a God who is a giver of joy. He's a father who loves to give good gifts to his children. He's given you uh, personal preferences and, and, and hobbies and propensities for things. If you want to go shoot a deer or catch a fish or shop in a mall, by all means, go do it. But Scripture says, delight thyself also in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. And some of us don't desire the things of God because we've never delighted in him. Delight thyself also. Everyone say also. I love that. That's an amazing life-giving, freeing verse that I can delight in other things and also in the Lord. But what I would challenge us to consider tonight is to take an inventory of our life, to look at all the pounds of things we've collected and ask, have I delighted equally as much in God as I have delighted in these goods? Have I prepared equally as much To stand in the presence of his holiness as I prepare to win a competition with whatever is my hobby. And I'm here to tell you that the secularization of the world didn't begin in a college campus. It began in the Christian home where parents said, oh yeah, you can do that. You can go to church next week. It began in the Christian homes where mamas and daddies and grandmamas and grandpas said, you know what, Uh, we're just going to skip devotions for now because we're so busy and we got to make sure that that we're ready. And we worry more about helping our students hone their athletic skills when they have like a one in eight 
thousand percent chance of ever winning an Olympic competition or being entered into the Olympics to begin with. Can, can I just tell you, your kid is not going to be in the NBA. Your kid is not going to be an Olympian. Your kid, well, my kid can. Yeah, that's what every parent says. And if your kid proves me wrong, cool, I'll give you $1,000. Like Brady's like, <laughs> I'll write the check out tonight. What I'm saying to you is this. While the chances are slim to none that your kid ever wins that level of competition, there's a 100% chance they'll stand before God one day. Have you prepared them, equipped them, trained them, discipled them, practiced with them on how to study the word, how to pray, why gathering with the church is important, or is church just another thing that we do? Well, we need to have our family time. Yeah, that's why God created the church. This is family time. Well, we need to, we, we need to rest. Yeah, you do. You need to come in here and rest in the promises of God and fix your schedule so you're not so exhausted all the time because chances are if you're exhausted by going, 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 there's one thing that you've probably neglected and that's spending time in prayer. If all that the next generation had to see was what we had modeled publicly, what would they be left with? A sinking ship, more than likely. If we were to take an average... Like Jesus is speaking here in Luke chapter 12, so many of us have said, we're, we're going to lay things up for the future and, and we're going to take it easy and we're going to eat and we're going to drink and be merry. But God said, only I know the moment that your soul is going to be required of you. Are you ready? And so many of us in this room, online, around the world, have many plans mapped out for our life over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30. But we have no plan for what if tomorrow was when God required our life of us. We don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. We don't know what the Lord has planned. But if God could get the attention of the world through a boat, surely it won't take much to get the attention of this body. When the iceberg was discovered, it took the captain over 30 seconds to make his decision on whether or not to steer away from it. 30 seconds. The research that has been done extensively has proven that by taking action at the right moment, the ship could have missed that iceberg in its entirety. And from impact to conclusion, the boat made contact with that iceberg for only 10 seconds. It was 10 seconds of a collision that robbed over 1,000 people of their lives that night. The unsinkable ship going down in a one and a million coincidental collision. How do you know God sunk that ship? The timing. Uh, secondly, the tide. One 20-year veteran of the sea noted to the captain before retiring to bed how he in his entire career had never seen the water so smooth and calm as this particular night. But while this might seem like easy sailing to a novice, smooth water would prove to be most dangerous. Because one way that you spot an iceberg in the middle of the ocean is to watch the waves crash up against it. When they crash up against an iceberg, they move off and they create a foam that can be easily discovered but this veteran of the sea who had served in the navy for decades said to the captain i have never and i've sailed almost every ocean i have never seen the ocean this calm in my entire life there were no waves to warn them that night and i want you to take a look at first thessalonians chapter 5 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says this, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
If you've been around children, you know that the only time you really need to be worried is when you hear nothing. If you have teenagers, the only time that you really have to be concerned is not when they're being loud and rambunctious. You really need to pause when there is peace because something unpeaceful is being plotted. I get a little bit worried when things are calm. I get a little bit bothered when someone isn't rocking the boat a little bit. I get a little bit nervous when Satan or someone else doesn't have a problem with what it is that I'm doing. Because when there's a storm, I'm always running to the arms of my Savior, but when there's calm, I typically feel like I'm in control. I don't know about you, and I can't speak for Pastor Phil, but I can say in my years of pastoring, I knew that we were headed in the right direction and that God was up to something and that he was actually at the steering wheel when there were people who were crashing against the boat, when there were people trying to rock the boat. I I really enjoyed that because you could take it to the bank. They're trying to rock the boat because we're headed in a right direction. If people have a problem, I know that God is up to something. But if no one's got a problem with what you're doing and no one is upset with the way that you're living and no one is a little bit uncomfortable by the way that you pursue Christ in your life, friend, you are not doing it the right way. Amen. I get a little bit nervous when things seem so calm and peaceful because I don't know what the enemy's up to in that moment. He's plotting something behind the scenes. And then I get a little bit nervous. Who is he plotting with? Who is he talking to? Because often it's the person that you would least expect in that moment. I like it when the water is a little bit rocky. I like flying on planes with turbulence. That's weird, but it feels great. To me, it's just like riding a wooden roller coaster and it clears out your sinuses real quick. It's an amazing time. But in the life of this fellowship at Central, it's a good thing when the water is a little bit choppy because when the water is choppy and the boat is rocking, it is easy to spot the dangers up ahead. But when everything seems calm and cool and collected, we start to feel like we are in control. And I believe that there are so many churches that were the Titanic, they've had to close their doors in this season and they'll never reopen inside those facilities. They lost it all because they were coasting on smooth waters. They were not doing evangelism. They were not reaching their community. They were not focused on the next generation. They had stored up money in the bank, and they were paying their pastor's measly salary on what they had put in savings, not doing anything, scared to spend, budget, 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 penny, pinch, penny, pinch, not realizing that the rapture could happen at any moment, that Jesus could return tomorrow, that people are dying and going to hell today, but we're just going to maintain because everything is smooth, no one's mad at us right now, everything is really calm, and we're just going to enjoy this cozy water. That makes me nervous. Satan likes calm water. It's the smooth sailing that night that I believe gave those men a false sense of security. And like the rich man and Lazarus, he thought, the captain, that he had all the time in the world. Things were going well, but I'm here to tell you that the battle isn't the thing that breaks most people. Most people are battered and beaten by blind security. It's not the battles that are going to destroy you. Good news, Jesus already won the victory. If you take this book and, spoiler alert, flip to the very end, let me just make sure, Yeah, we still win. Jesus still wins. The book hasn't changed. The battle has been won. The victory belongs to you. Now, you might lose a little tiff here and there with battling your flesh or something like that, but the point that we're in a battle proves that Jesus is coming soon. We're fighting against sin. We're fighting for the souls of men. And the thing that will destroy churches, the thing that will destroy people, the thing that will take lives in this very room is not the battle. Battles are draining, but battles do not destroy most people. Blind sense of security does. Hmm. I believe God sunk that ship because of the timing and the tide. I believe because of the turning. Um, The type of iceberg that the Titanic hit was called a blueberg. Uh, When a blueberg has been in the water for a certain amount of time, it begins to turn and it begins to roll. And because of this, it's no longer white. 
It develops a a blue hue that is nearly impossible to see, even to the most trained eye. The men watching on the ship that night were professionals. They were veterans of the sea. But as they stared off into the night, God sent a blueberg that would be impossible, almost impossible to see from a distance. How do you know God sunk that ship? Lastly, because of the twilight. That fateful night was a moonless night. History records this to be true. The diaries of the captains of that ship recorded it as well. The only thing they had shining above them were the stars. What are you getting at, Pastor? What I'm telling you is this. The Titanic was the fastest, she was the richest, she was the biggest, and she was the best, but God was still in control. She received six warnings before that moment. She hadn't been gone from Southampton even one hour before receiving the first warning. She received the first warning of danger around an hour after she departed from the port on her maiden voyage. She received her last warning one hour before the strike. The Titanic struck the iceberg at 11.35 p.m., but at 10.30 p.m., the Californian signaled a warning detailing the exact coordinates of the iceberg. In fact, that's how the sunken ship, the Titanic, was located years later by using the coordinates of the ship log of the Californian. The Californian gave them the warning The threat was en route. We even have a picture of the Californian so you can see it. The men operating the communication system were professionals, highly trained and and very rare. But because of their specific craft, it was hard to find work for them. They were often underpaid. So they were allowed on board the boats to send messages to the shore sort of as freelance phone callers and telegrammers for a price. So if you were on board one of these ships, you could get in touch with the man who was in charge of the radio system and say, I need to get a telegram to shore and I'll pay you $50. I'll pay you $100 to send it. And they would use that as an opportunity to store up money because if the ship's not on the water, they are out of work As the Californian was attempting to warn the Titanic, Jack Phillips abruptly ended the conversation with a loud. Now, get this. The messenger on board the Californian continues to signal to the Titanic, you're headed for danger. You're headed for danger. Here's the exact location of the danger. There's danger ahead. We spotted it. Don't go that way. There's danger ahead. But Jack Phillips on board the Californian interrupted, and he communicated these words. Shut up, shut up, I'm working, Cape Race. That night he was helping someone make some money, possibly placing a bet on something that was happening on another continent. And as the messenger sending warnings proceeded to remove his headphones, he then went to bed. When the SOS signal would go out, the Californian would not receive the SOS because the messenger attempted to warn and attempted to warn and attempted to warn. But because the Titanic said, shut up, shut up, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. He said, fine, if you don't want to hear it, I'm taking my headphones off, I'm going to bed. And when the Titanic struck the iceberg and began to sink that night, no one on board the Californian would even know because they had decided to be done trying. The the Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. We have a job to do, church. We have been placed here for a reason. If the point of your Christianity was to get saved and then do nothing, God would have taken you to heaven the moment that you accepted him as, his, as, his, as your Savior. The point of your life is this, to glorify God and fulfill the Great Commission, not to have a thriving Sunday school class, not to run this ministry and that ministry and do this and do that. If you are not personally, I'm speaking to you and you and you and you and you and you and every person in this room, if you've got a heartbeat and breath in your lungs, your job and not just your calling, because calling sounds so like, oh, well, Pastor Phil has a calling on his life, but I'm, I don't have a calling. God's command on your life is to daily be telling someone 
Danger is ahead. Danger is ahead. The exact coordinates of the danger. There's hell ahead. There's problems ahead. There's sin ahead. Don't go that way. Don't go that direction. Turn around. Let me, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me point you to the cross. And if you're not doing that, you are living in sin. And God doesn't hear your prayers. We wonder why God doesn't show up in our prayer meetings. It's because we're not living for him and we're not telling people about him. It's the greatest apostasy of the American church that we believe that we can be in God's will by coming into a building and sitting in a chair and not witnessing and evangelizing and testifying everywhere else that we go. God help us. Somebody say amen. And some of us are not just on board the Titanic. We might be on board the Californian. There was a time when we used to Tell people about Jesus. There was a time when we used to serve. I used to be in that ministry, but I just got burned out. Uh, there was a time when I used to tell, share my testimony, but I just got burned. There was a time when I used to tell people the truth, but I just got tired of receiving all the hate. There was a time when I used to share Jesus, but and now I just wouldn't know what to say. There was a time when I used to. There was a time when I would have. There's a time when I thought that I could do it better than I can do today. But because the world is evil and people are mean and they keep telling me, shut up, they don't want to hear what I have to say. I tried to share Jesus with my kids, but they keep telling me they don't want to talk about Jesus. And so we have a rule now that when we get together at Thanksgiving and Christmas, we don't talk about church and we don't talk about, about politics. We don't talk about either one of those things. You want to know what Jesus talked about more than anything else? Religion and politics. I imagine that if Jesus took time to talk about those two things a lot, that you probably should too. I want to go on a rabbit trail here, but I won't. I'll just remind you simply this, that the gospel is your job to tell you're the hands and feet of jesus and if you can't remember the last time that you led someone to the lord and i'm just not just saying bringing them to an altar that's wonderful i personally got saved in church so many of my friends got saved in other places i loved running youth camps because i remember leading someone to the lord at the home plate on the softball field it was the greatest home run that i ever hit the only one actually you can't remember the last time that you personally opened a Bible, shared the gospel, and led someone to the Lord. You have a problem. You have a problem. You have a problem. And your problem is sin. Do you get this, church? Do you get it? And some of us are on board the Californian. We meant well. We told someone. We used to do that, but we're not doing it anymore. For one reason or another, we have hung up because we were tired of being hurt. Can I tell you that no hurtful words that you hear and no hurtful thing that happens to you, no hurtful situation could be greater than having the skin ripped off your bones, being nailed to a cross and hung up there to die as everyone watches on. Your hurt is nothing. Paul said, this temporary discomfort is nothing compared to the glory which we will see on that shore in eternity. Nothing. It's nothing. It pales in comparison. But some of us are the Californian. Can I challenge you tonight? Don't hang up when you're hurting. Don't hang up. Keep calling. Keep signaling. Keep telling. Keep sharing. Keep, keep inviting. Keep doing it over and over. But they'll get annoyed with me. Yes, they will. But then one day when they walk into the gate of heaven, they'll be pretty excited that you annoyed them. I, I don't have biblical ground for this. I, I, I don't believe this is just a hypothetical here. Just imagine for a moment that at the great white throne judgment that we read about, as all of those who did not accept Jesus stand and kneel before the throne of a righteous judge, imagine if there was a balcony where you and I sat watching this take place. There is the great throne and the door to hell beside it. And as they walk up to the throne and they say, please search the book again. Please search the book. I thought my name was there. I, I went to church. Um, I, I had a Christian grandma. I, I, uh, I tried to live a good life. Please search the book again. Search the book again. I wonder if they wouldn't scan the crowd and find me or find you and say, why did you not tell me I 
and their eternity forever and ever and ever and ever in fire and fire and fire and fire and remembering and remembering and remembering and remembering will be of not the times they heard, but the times that they could have heard and you didn't tell them because you were worried about a temporary inconvenience because they hurt your feelings when they rejected you and they'll spend forever in hell because you wanted to not make any waves. Proverbs 21 seems to say to me, whoever stops his ears at the cry of the poor, he'll also cry himself, but he will not be heard. Whoever closes his ears to the cries of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. What the author is saying, what the Holy Spirit is writing is, if you are able to close your ears to a world that is lost and going to hell, if you're able to shut your eyes to the needs of the widows and the orphans and the poor and the homeless, if you're able to see them and hear them and do nothing, the reason you're able to do that is because you're not saved. Because the New Testament would go on to say that when you cry to him, he will answer you. Who are the only people that God is able to not answer? Those who don't have a direct line. We're on the Californian. We might be on board the Samson. It was the third ship that night. This one right here. A smaller ship, but was capable of saving almost all of the lives that were on board the Titanic. It's been noted in history as the ship that passed in the night. The Samson was only miles away from the crash site, and they heard the SOS signal go out on the radio. They saw with their own eyes the emergency flares that were fired into the sky. And when interviewed in Congress, I believe, one of the crew commented and said, the most terrifying thing was to watch as the running lights of the Titanic faded and disappeared one by one as the boat sank into the freezing ocean that night. From the sight of the first signal, the Samson had two hours to respond, two hours to do something. And had they done so, every single person on board the Titanic would have been saved. They were close enough, get this, they heard the signal, they saw the flares, they watched the ship sink, and they did nothing. The captain, later in an interview, overcome with grief and shame, wept as he told the story. And the reporter, hoping to ease his sorrow, asked, well, wh why didn't you go? Hoping there was a good reason. Maybe he'd say, our boat couldn't fit any other people. We, we, we weren't able to navigate through the water. He was hoping to help the captain cope with his grief. And Captain Carl Ring responded that they had illegal cargo on board the boat. They had been killing and poaching dead baby seals, which was illegal. And if they would have rescued the passengers of the Titanic... Once they arrived at any port to deliver those passengers, their boat would have been inspected and all of the crew would have been arrested. So they allowed over 1,500 people to die before their very eyes and all they had to show for it was some dead baby seals. They loved money more than they loved the souls of men. Women and children froze and died and drowned that night because those men on board that boat had something on their ship. They had something in their fellowship that they were ashamed would be discovered. One of the second mates aboard the ship testified to Congress five days after the tragic sinking. He recounted how he came up from the boiler room just to get a breath of fresh air and to smoke a cigarette. And just 18 miles away, he saw one flare and then a second and then a third and knowing the, the waters as he did, he said to the captain and to the others around, these are not fireworks. And the congressman asked him, sir, did you know what it was? And second mate Ernest Gill said this, I did. Those flares were the international sign for distress. The congressman asked him, why didn't you report it to an officer on duty? And Ernest Gill, the second mate of the Samson said, I didn't think it was any of my business. 
So he flicked his cigarette butt into the ocean and went back down into the warm bowels of the ship to go to sleep. Why did 1,500 people perish that night? Because the men on board the ship hid. They hid their sin and they hid from the signs. There's a story just like this in scripture where we find Israel going into a battle and Joshua, uh, God says to Joshua, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves again to the morrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. God had given some specific instructions. Everything that you find, all the spoil of this battle belongs to me. Don't touch it. Don't take it. It's mine. But Achan saw something that looked shiny. He saw something that looked like it would provide for his family. And so he took it. But in shame, he buried it below his tent. And because of the sin of Achan, men of the army of Israel perished. People lost their daddies, they lost their uncles, they lost their brothers, they lost their friends, all because one man said, my shiny illegal thing is more important to me than the souls of men. And that day his wife and his precious babies were stoned. Why? Because he said, the thing that I have buried, the thing that I have hid, the thing that no one else knows about that's deep down inside me is ultimately more important than publicly repenting and saving the lives of other men. And the reason why 1,500 people died that night is because an illegal something on board the ship was more important. Church, Some of you are headed for a collision course with death and you're not prepared. Some of you have been so hurt in the ministry that you've hung up the phone and you're not sharing the gospel at all. But some of you in this room tonight and some of you watching online have sin in your heart, uh, addiction of sin. It's a piece of bitterness that you'd go back to. It's an anger that you never rooted out. It is a addiction that you cannot shake. It's repetitive. It's repetitive. It's repetitive. And you say, I'll stop whenever I want to. That doesn't have control over me. I only struggle when that person gets around me. I only have a problem when I encounter that particular situation. But listen, listen, listen. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things. Everyone say all things. Or become new. You're not going to be perfect, but you're not going to sin and enjoy it. And I do not believe that a true believer can continue to live in perpetual sin over and over and over and over and truly be a child of God. Some of us aren't helping other people because if we invited them into our homes and into our lives, they would see just how hypocritical we are. And we'd rather live with our hidden sin than save the souls of men. We're on board. The Samson. Funny how what destroyed lives for the ship, Samson, is the same type of thing that destroyed the eyes and the life of the judge, Samson. Something he enjoyed more than he loved the Lord. What's your thing? And some of us think that, oh, secret sin, man, that's got got something. I mean, that's like alcohol addiction, you know. That's like a... That's like a pornography addiction. Oh, I mean, that's like somebody who's really bitter and just angry and mean. No, um, what about the sin of greed? I don't have greed. I'm not greedy. Yeah, but you haven't tithed. So you've been robbed God, you're greedy. In fact, the New Testament talks about uh, tithing and offering. That's over and above the 10%. That's like giving to the mission of the church. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is just not stealing. Giving is when you go above the 10%. And some of us are not tithing, we're not giving. Why? Because we're greedy. Well, it's not because I'm greedy. I don't have a whole lot. Mm, tell that to the homeless person in Africa. The person that you used to threaten your kids with to make them eat all the food. Yeah, that goes always. I don't have a lot. Oh, maybe it's a worry mentality. You're a worrier. You're an you're a anxiety or... You're a depressionist. All those are religion. It's what we put our faith and trust and energy into. Well, that's just my personality. I'm mine on the Enneagram, so I just... No, 
you're a creation of God, and his word says that you have victory. You can have remission from sin, not continual relapse. That's what the blood of Jesus does. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are... Past way, behold, all things are becoming. It's not that you won't struggle, but it's that you're saved, and you're going to keep serving. And some of us aren't serving. We're not discipling. I don't have permission to do this. I'm just going to. Um, Sunday school is not discipleship. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, church, not discipleship. It's not. It's great study. Worship and gathering together is commanded in Scripture, so it's vital. Worshiping together is commanded. It's an important ingredient to the life of a true believer. Um, but it's not discipleship. There's no way, Pastor Phil, that you can cover everything that every individual in this room needs for that particular week in one single sermon. You can't. And you, I mean, you, you already know that. But some of us expect you to. I'm not discipling anyone because I invited them to church and Pastor Phil can tell them. I mean, they're getting the word. Reading your Bible is not discipleship. Discipleship is also not a curriculum. It's not adding something to your calendar. Well, I'm not discipling anyone because I don't have an extra time. I don't have time to meet up with them at McDonald's for coffee every Friday at 7 a.m. and go through a Bible study. Not discipleship. Discipleship is not adding something to your calendar. It's involving someone in your calendar. And when you are discipling someone, that means they're doing stuff with you. Hey, we have dinner because everyone has dinner. We have dinner. Come over for dinner. Oh, we don't want to have guests. Our house is not clean. They need to see your dirty house. I don't want to invite them over because I have my crazy wife. They need to see that. They need to see the good and the bad and the ugly of what it looks like to live a devoted life of Christ. I said the crazy wife thing just for Ed. He paid me extra. Um, they need to see that. You need to be reproducing yourselves. Can I ask you a question? What I'm going to do in just a moment, I'm going to give you the instructions first. In just a moment, I'm going to have everyone stand. And I'm going to ask you to call out the name of the person that you are personally discipling, a, a younger man or a younger lady that you are personally discipling on like a weekly basis. I'm going to have you call them. And once you call out their name, then you'll be allowed to sit down. Are you ready? And the reason why the air just got sucked out of the room is because 99% of us are living in sin. Well, I don't have time to disciple. I'm too old to disciple. Listen, young people don't need you to be, uh, as Liv says, hip. with the times. They just need you to be genuine. And some of us are the Samson. We're not helping anyone. We're not discipling anyone. We're not evangelizing anyone because we've got some stuff. We need 